He was a very dignified figure, but also one who was absolutely convinced of his own righteousness. And this is how he wanted people to remember him. Charles I is unique in terms of the English monarchy in that he was the only king executed by his own people. He comes to prominence with the death of his elder brother when he's suddenly catapulted into becoming heir to the thrones of England and Scotland. He very much follows his father's view that he is ruling by the divine right of God. Charles was trying to take back the absolutist power that his own father had wanted. But the difficulty is that Parliament were not particularly happy with the idea of being forced to loan the king money on regular intervals. It should be pointed out with Charles that all three of his kingdoms, England, Scotland and Ireland, all rebel against him. So as you approach the beginnings of a civil war, you can see that Charles is not at this stage been given the advice he needs. It's going to go worse and worse and worse for him. When the Civil War begins, nobody has it in mind that they want to remove the king or even execute him. That's simply not in anybody's mind. And what happened is that his head was held up and the executioner said, behold, the head of a traitor. Because there was a real sense, not of celebration or of jubilation that he'd been executed, but of fear. What comes now? What's going to happen? What have we done? The Stuart era was a remarkably complicated era because it came between the Elizabethan era and the Georgian era. And during this time, there was a huge amount of upheaval, both social and political. And I think it's fair to say that when we talk about early modern England, the Stuart era is perhaps the first true indication of what England became. And if you look at the way in which the artistic scene, the cultural scene, the role of women changed over this period. I think it's fair to say that the Stuart era was among the most consequential areas in English history, and that actually when you look at what was achieved in this remarkably short space of time, we can only look at its legacy as being one of the most important things that English history ever produced. Charles I was the younger son of James VI and I and Anna of Denmark, so he was never expected to become King of England or King of Scotland. His elder brother, Prince Henry, was very charismatic. People were looking forward to his accession to the throne, whereas Charles was very much a background figure in his childhood. He seems to have been quite sickly. Um, he didn't learn to walk until um, a, an older age, and he's quite a shy figure. He was essentially treated as the runt of the litter. He was very short, and he was very conscious all his life about his exceptionally short stature. I mean, he was barely five foot high. And the fact is, is that he'd, he suffered from rickets as a boy. This always made him unathletic. He felt that he was ungainly. But the fact that he often had to you know, endure bed rest meant that he was able to read and he was able to write, he was able to study literature and the classics in a way that most monarchs simply weren't able to because he was not somebody who was going to be going out and having a sort of, you know, a wild life of parties and a wild life of horse riding and things like that. He had to have a much more insular, much more sedate existence. Well, Charles I is unique in terms of the English monarchy in that he was the only king to be executed by his own people. And that is a thing I think defines Charles for many people, that he was the only monarch to be publicly beheaded. When you take that away from him, you can look at a man who's essentially like two kings in one. The first was a weak, querulous figure who picked battles he never needed to fight, who had a grotesquely overinflated sense of his own brilliance and his own abilities, and who arguably deserved what came to him. The second was a man who was a patron of the arts. He had a far greater understanding of things like culture and literature than any of his predecessors, he was somebody who had a genuine aptitude for speeches and for pu public presentation. And in many respects, he was an outstanding monarch. He wasn't given the credit that he deserved. So we have to combine these two apparently contradictory figures and to ask who was the real Charles I. And the answer comes back. He was a multifaceted, difficult man, like so many others are, who had the misfortune to be king. <laughs> 
He comes to prominence with the death of his elder brother when he's suddenly catapulted into becoming heir to the thrones of England and Scotland. And he very much follows his father's view that he is ruling by the divine right of God, that God has placed him on the throne as King of England and King of Scots. James I was somebody who historians have traditionally seen as rather a lightweight king. He was a stopgap in many regards between more interesting and more consequential figures on the throne. Because he was the King of Scotland who then became the King of England, it was a very unusual thing to have happened because obviously there was a sense that he was not to the manner born as Elizabeth and Mary had been, but he was somebody instead who was taking over because he had to. And there was a lot of talk about, oh, well, if Elizabeth had just married advantageously and had had an heir, none of this would have happened. But I think what he had to weigh up was, on the one hand, he was becoming king at a time of enormous upheaval. But what he also thought was, we do not need to have our country so divided. The fact that he'd been king of Scotland made people hope that he could actually bring England and Scotland together. So that was an advantage. And then more prosaically, he was a man. He was a man who was married. He was a man who had children. Therefore, it was hoped and felt that he could restore a kind of balance to the monarchy. Well, of his three children, as, as is often the way of these things, his closest relationship was with his eldest, who, who died unfortunately young, because obviously his eldest, Henry, was somebody who was seen as having all the virtues of kingship, who was going to go off and become a noble leader. His second, Charles, was a weak, sickly, short child, seen as something of a runt of a litter. But his third, Elizabeth, was obviously a woman, so there was no real need to bother with her the same way. And this might seem harsh, it might seem cruel that the first-born son is the one who is lionised and the second-born son is seen as a despair. But I think it's quite interesting if you compare it to George V and his relationships with Edward VIII and then George VI. But Edward VIII was the one who was thought to be charismatic and thought to be the one who was going to do everything well. And the younger one, Bertie, was felt to be the runt of the litter. So if you can look at that as a parallel, it's fascinating because you see the way in which James, who I don't think was a cruel man, was a negligent man, was deeply disappointed that the succession was actually coming to pass to Charles. The difficulty that Charles faced with his brother Henry was that Henry was the one who was going to be king. And it was accepted and it ordained that Henry would be king. And Henry was a much more conventionally handsome, much more conventionally gung-ho figure. He was the one who was going off and racing horses and having parties and having falling in love and so forth. And Charles was very much the younger brother left in his shadow. So when Henry died prematurely, there was a real sense not only of loss, but also of this is embarrassing for the family. This is a sense that we can't have as strong a hold on the institution of the monarch as we wanted because our A-list boy has died and our B, if not C-list boy, has to be put forward. Charles's relationship with his father was a distant and cold one because James's relationship with his parents, or his, his mother at least, had been similarly distant and cold. And so you, you have to view a sense that in all of these royal families, I think this is continuing to the present day as well, I don't think this is a, just a, a limited of the 17th century, you have a sense that the child of the king or the child of the queen is somebody who is essentially both mollycoddled and mistreated at the same time. They're given every material advantage you can imagine, but they're also told constantly, this is what your life is going to be. You are a symbol rather than a human being. And I think that Charles, because he was a more intelligent figure, saw the idea of this symbolic upbringing as being a rather cold and rather unsettling one. So I don't think that he was particularly happy about what he was condemned to. Unfortunately, Charles is not as an adept a politician as his father. Although his father has had male favorites, um, Charles is seen as particularly dependent on them, particularly of um, the Duke of Buckingham, whom he's inherited from his father. He is also seen as under the influence of his Catholic wife, Henrietta Maria, who is disliked. And Charles is, Charles is convinced that he rules with God's authority, so Charles will not listen to criticism. It must be very strange when you become king to essentially inherit the man who's your father's lover, not just as your closest advisor, but as a person who is in most respects your co-monarch. 
And Buckingham's a fascinating figure because he's somebody who I don't feel has been quite, given quite enough attention by history. I mean, he was murdered at the age of 35. But before then, he became extraordinarily powerful at court. He became somebody who was influential in a way that perhaps the king wasn't. He was somebody who was essentially ruling the country in all but name. He was almost a regent. And but Charles defers to him because he would have grown up seeing Buckingham as this man who was controlling his father. And essentially, I don't think there's any sexual relationship between Buckingham and, and Charles I, but there was certainly this very strong homosocial relationship. Buckingham was charismatic, he used this charisma to get what he wanted out of Charles. And so he was seen as a man who was actually making the decisions in the kingdom, much more than the king was. When you become king, and you never particularly wanted to become king, you've got two choices. The first is to do a very, very, very bad job of it, as Edward VIII did, and try and, try and abdicate. But in the 17th century, this was not really an option, because you can't abdicate. The only way you're going to be abdicating is if somebody cuts your head off. And Charles knew that if he was going to make any kind of success out of being king, he had to tone down his own impulses towards literature, creativity, the arts. He had to make peace of parliament. He had to try and unite the warring aristocrats around him. But he wasn't the sort of character of person who could do all this stuff. He was not committed enough to the kind of nitty gritty of political machinations. So what he wanted to do instead was essentially to rule much the same way that his father had, ignoring parliament, asking them for money, and then essentially shutting them down as soon as they wouldn't do so. Well, Charles's marriage to Henrietta Maria was one that was done explicitly to, to bring about peace with Spain, because it was felt for such a long time that Spain was the great threat, not just to national stability, but to international stability. And also given the fact that the country was impoverished, nobody had any desire to convert to an expensive and time-consuming war. And so the obvious way of dealing with this was to bring about a match between Charles I and, Henry, and Henrietta Maria, who was a Spanish princess. And this was seen as pragmatism, this was seen as a very good way of finally bringing about what's obviously been longed for between Elizabeth I and Philip of Spain. And it was felt that it was going to become a, a marriage of convenience. As it became a love match of some intensity between the two parties, it was an unexpected development to the greatest extent. But we can look at Charles and relationship with Henrietta as being one that was vital to his happiness and vital to his own success as king, such as it was. Charles marries Henrietta Maria of France, who is of course a Catholic, and it's agreed that she will be permitted to worship as a Catholic in England, even though of course it's illegal to attend Catholic worship and has been since the 1550s. Henrietta Maria refuses to be crowned with her husband because she doesn't want to be involved in a Protestant ceremony. So this immediately makes her quite unpopular and Catholics are really everyone's favourite bogeyman in 17th century Britain. Um, they are seen as agents of the Antichrist. They are seen as you know evil um, figures. So Henrietta Maria immediately gets off on the wrong foot by um, just by being a Catholic. Charles is very much not a Catholic. Charles has been raised in the Church of England, but he's also under the influence of Archbishop William Lord. And Archbishop Lord is very far from being a Protestant as members of the Scottish Kirk or as Puritans, the hotter sort of Protestants in England would, would see. Lord is an Arminian, and what this means is he is very, very high church. Um, so he sees the church as the house of God, and as such, he wants it to be beautiful. So he wants to bring back images in the churches. He wants to bring back the altars, because in the Scottish Kirk, and also among the Puritans in England, they don't have altars. They have communion tables in the middle of the church. Lord not only wants to reinstate the altars, but he wants to rail them off, fence them off, so that the congregation can't come close to the altar, because he sees them as so holy. So Lordianism, it is absolutely Protestant, but it's not Protestant as far as the Scottish Kirk or the English Puritans see it. So while Charles is committed Lordian, it does set him at odds with a large proportion of his kingdom. What was interesting about his marriage to Henrietta Maria is that she was a practicing Roman Catholic. And of course, Catholicism in Britain at this time was regarded with great suspicion after the reign of Elizabeth and the reign of James. 
Charles was not somebody who was himself a Catholic, but he was a lot more Catholic adjacent, both literally and symbolically, than Ivan James or Elizabeth had been. And it's certainly the case that what he did at court was not to permit Catholicism exactly or to bring about a time where Catholics were going to be welcomed, but he did you know, stop the persecution of them. He did stop the absolute sense that if you were Catholic, you were going to find yourself strung up. So we have to see that as a kind of, as the influence of his wife, as certainly somebody who really did have that kind of strong personal, social, political influence on him. Charles I's coronation was not the grand affair that might have been expected, mainly because there was no money to pay for it. And I think that's what set off the reign in, in the wrong kind of way, that every single penny that was being spent on the coronation was resented because the country was poor, like there was just simply not enough money to pay for anything. And so the idea of this king who didn't give any great impression of wanting to be king, having this slightly budget coronation where it was felt that things were not being done in a properly monarchical and regal fashion. I think mean, that very much made people think from the off, he does not have the trappings of kingship, he does not have the full ability to rise to the occasion. And I think that the fact that the pageantry and everything else was so vital to establish the king at these points was not there. I think that made him seem pathetic and rather limited. Well, the difficulty with his relationship with Parliament is that he never had any money, and Parliament didn't have any money either. So what he would do was he would say to Parliament, you are going to loan me X amount of money on these occasions, or I'm going to prorogue you. And by proroguing Parliament, not allowing them to sit, Charles was trying to take back the absolutist power that his own father had wanted. But the difficulty is that Parliament were not particularly happy with the idea of being forced to loan the king money on regular intervals, because they saw it as being not their role to be catering to a profligate king who was far too much in for all to a small number of men around him. Even though he had married specifically for the purpose of there not being a war against Spain, the elements within his court, including Buckingham, who were very strongly pro a Spanish war won out. Because what was felt and believed was there was an opportunity to have a very quick, successful reprise for Spanish Armada, to launch a raiding party to Spain, come back, have a huge success. Obviously, Charles was stymied by his wife being unsurprisingly violently against the idea of her home country being raided. But he was overruled by elements in the court who thought this was the only possible way of establishing his personal superiority and the country's superiority. If there was a war against Spain, it went disastrously wrong, nothing of any worth was achieved, it was horrendously expensive, and what ended up happening was it just damaged Charles' reputation even further, so it was causing an enormous rift between him and his wife. Charles inherits a favourite from his father, George Villiers, Duke of Buckingham, who is a very attractive young man. Um, there's certainly a very close relationship between James the Sixth and I and Buckingham. Charles is very, very happy to make Buckingham his, his own favourite and effectively his chief minister. Buckingham is very, very unpopular. Um, he's not particularly good at politics. Um, he is involved in failed military expeditions. Um, his foreign policy is, is quite troubled. Um, and really, most of the country absolutely loathe Buckingham. Charles was supportive of the Duke of Buckingham, in large part because the Duke of Buckingham had been so influential for his father that he thought he's this older, more experienced man who's going to be able to tell me what to do. And that's something that I think a lot of monarchs have, have always had, the sense that if there is an advisor who's going to be able to control their decisions, it removes the difficulty of theirs. I mean, in, in a sense, Charles was asking Buckingham to be a kind of co-monarch, a private secretary, a friend, a confidant, and everything else. Buckingham had his own agenda, and Buckingham's major agenda was to be as important and influential as he possibly could. The difficulty is, is that you can't have a country with two kings, especially if one of them is somebody who just happens to be an aristocrat who's advanced to a current eminence because of a relationship with a previous king. And Buckingham became more and more unpopular in the country, especially because he, I think, rightly was blamed for catastrophic involvement in, in the Spanish War. So eventually, Buckingham was, was actually killed by somebody. There's a great story that Buckingham was stabbed, and because he was quite a resilient character, he, he said villain and made to chase after the man who'd stabbed him, whereas he'd been stabbed fatally and dropped dead. And although the person who killed him was somebody who was, of course, hanged for it, the public saw him as, as a martyr, so it went horribly badly wrong from any perspective of establishing support for, you know, 
Buckingham and for what his influence. And I think after Buckingham's death, Charles found himself increasingly on his own. In 1628, he is assassinated. And actually, public opinion is very much on, in favor of the assassin. And there are people arrested for drinking the health of the assassin. So it's a very difficult time for Charles. And it's really a moment where he perhaps should have stopped and thought about his popularity and you know how he could sort of regain the love of his people. But unfortunately, he just plows on. Well, there's always been this, I mean, I think to this day, there is a belief amongst monarchs in this thing called the divine right of kings, which is that as king or as queen, you have been divinely ordained by God to rule. And that is the most arrogant thing that any human being could say. But it was also vitally important for the institution of the monarchy because you had to be able to say, if you were king, I have a right to be an absolutist monarch. I have a right to be operating in this way. I have a right because it's been sent to me by God. And given that religion played an absolutely crucial role within the 17th century, whether it was Protestantism, Catholicism or anything else, there was no question whatsoever that if you were able to articulate this convincingly, that you were, nobody could really question your right to be king. Charles is also very dogmatic and doesn't necessarily understand the nuances of his, of his kingdoms. It should be pointed out with Charles that all three of his kingdoms, England, Scotland and Ireland, all rebel against him. And I mean, it must be said that the common factor in all three is, of course, Charles and the way that he governs. Well, what Charles did in order to raise taxes was to put taxes on the most uh, pathetic, swinging things imaginable. I mean, you could, virtually any household good, like wool, was taxed, and he would tax it, you know, he taxed income. He was, I think, the first monarch to make sure this was done. And there were all these taxes put out, which were increasingly unpopular, but they were done out of necessity. The difficulty was, was that if you are a king who is associated with tax, associated with taking money away from the people who don't have a lot of money in the first place, we going to become extremely unpopular very quickly. And Parliament would try and intercede, and Parliament would try and say, well, hang on, you can't do this. This is not what people want. And Charles ignored them, because his attitude was a, a, a wider and grander attitude. It's that tax needs to be collected. I, I need to tax for my course. I mean, he was, I mean, he was a man who, of course, he had interests in art and culture and so forth, and he was not a modest man in terms of his dress, in terms of his art collection, and so on. But it's not, it's not right to see Charles as being profligate the way that other members of the royal family have been. He said he was somebody who saw this as a, as a necessity in order to maintain the court where it needs to be maintained. So you have a sense of mutual incomprehension, but the trouble was, was that ordinary people being taxed were taking less and less and less pleasure in it. Charles inherits a very troubled position in both the English and the Scottish churches. And this largely dates back to the reigns of his father and also Elizabeth in England. Religion had never really been settled since the Reformation. So although both countries have Protestant churches, although quite different Protestant churches, there are large numbers of people who worship outside these structures. There are, of course, Catholics, and it's illegal to worship as a Catholic. But there are Protestants as well who don't find their place within the Church of England. For example, Puritans. Puritans are Calvinist in approach and much more staunch in their religion than the Church of England, which is very much a compromise settlement. Um, they particularly are not in favour of church hierarchies, so um, in general don't want bishops. And prefer a much plainer form of worship. They consider themselves to be the godly. They are the ones who will be saved, who will go to heaven. In Scotland, we have the Kirk, which is a national church. It's very Presbyterian, so quite similar to Puritans in a lot of ways. Um, again, not at all keen on bishops, not at all keen on the king being the head of the church. So Charles has inherited a huge number of problems. Charles is a member of the Church of England. Of course, I mean, he is the Supreme Governor of the Church of England. He favours Archbishop Lord, so he favours very much a high church. He is really the antithesis of a Puritan. He is as far from Puritans as you can be and still remain a Protestant, effectively. And this does lead him open to criticism. He is accused of being a covert Catholic, 
partly because of course his wife is Catholic and also because Archbishop Lord is commonly called a Catholic by his enemies. So it's a very, very troubled position. For Bishop Swords were the first wars that Charles encountered in his reign, and this was very much a Scottish-focused thing because the Scottish Covenanters were this band of people who essentially were dissatisfied with the Presbyterian cause. The difficulty that Charles found very early on was that his father being Scottish and his, of course, being half Scottish meant that he was going to be in a situation that Scotland played an unusually large amount of prominence within his own reign. But what, what it taught him was that having any kind of Scottish war was going to affect England, both from a financial perspective, but also in terms of how it, you know, the fact that there's a strongly religious element, and that he had to consider his own religious inclinations and his wife's religious inclinations set against those of England. And it, was, it should have been a lesson to him very, very early on that any kind of conflict which makes his religion great cost and great principle is going to be catastrophic, but it didn't teach him that lesson. And so unfortunately the Civil War was the inevitable successor to it all. Charles ploughs on with his religious policies in spite of mounting criticism. He has always favoured the Church of England over the Scottish Kirk because it places a monarch in control and he would like to see this replicated in Scotland. And as part of that, he attempts to impose effectively the English prayer book on the Scottish Kirk. What happened was that there were many periods during the 1620s and 1630s for Parliament essentially ceased to be a thing altogether because when they wouldn't give him the money that Charles wanted, Charles simply said, right, I'm going to prorogue you for years at a time. And so what we see, I mean, much more so than James I, is we see the idea of Charles as an absolutist monarch. And we can look at, say, Louis XIV in France as another example of absolutism at the time and how it worked. The advantage of absolutism is you can do what you like. You're not hemmed in by anyone apart from your advisers. You don't have parliament to be answerable. The difficulty about absolutist monarchy is that very, very fast, you as people are going to look at you and they're going to say, you are being a tyrant. You are doing this in a way which is completely unacceptable on every moral level imaginable. And as soon as the word tyrant or dictator becomes used, then it's very hard to shake that off. But if you're not governing with the consent of parliament and you're not having any concept of constitutional monarchy, you are setting up this enormous problem which, of course, blew open spectacularly with the Civil War. After Buckingham died or was murdered, the most important person in Charles's cabinet is too strong, but the most important person in, in Charles's court was Thomas Wentworth the Earl of Stratford, who became his right-hand man. He became the person responsible for most of the decisions that Charles made. He was somebody vigorous. He saw that essentially Charles should be allowed to be an absolutist monarch and he did everything he could to support that. He was somebody who was against the idea of Puritanism, he was against the idea of any rise of Parliament and so on. And so from that perspective, he wasn't a second Buckingham exactly because he lacked Buckingham's political skill, but what he was was he was somebody who was, he was a good man to have on your side, he was a very dangerous man to be against. But unfortunately, more and more people became absolutely horrified about the level of the power that he's having to, having to wield. That was ultimately what marked his death warrant. His execution was a very blunt way of saying to Charles, you are not going to be able to do what you want. If we can get rid of your closest advisor, we can get rid of you. And it was something that Charles should have known as soon as Strafford was executed, that there was no way back for him. But I think that you can see in Charles there's two warring impulses, no pun intended. The first is that he believed in the divine right of kings. He believed that he was the ordained king, ordained by God, and that he could behave as he wanted, and nobody had a right to judge him for it. But he'd seen the death of Buckingham, he'd seen the death of Stratford, he could see that there was a possibility that he was not going to be able to have any close counsellor who he trusted apart from his wife. But she had her own interests and she had her own ideas as well. So as you approach the beginnings of a civil war, you can see that Charles is not at this stage been given the advice he needs. It's going to go worse and worse and worse for him. Ireland was a problem and had been for a very long time because Ireland was seen as something that you couldn't control, that any incursion into Ireland was going to be difficult, both from a practical and logistical perspective, but also because any attempts to try and subdue the people was going to lead to an awful lot of ill feeling because Ireland of the 17th century was an unfocused and unformed place. Fighting there was a kind of version of fighting a, a guerrilla war, but it was also felt that it was important to try and subjugate them. 
but it didn't go particularly well. I mean, it was something that Cromwell had to do later, but Charles's early attempts to fight, fight an Irish war were essentially a failure. Charles is an absolute ruler. Parliament is a medieval institution, so it has existed since the medieval period, and members of local communities will send their members of parliament to uh, Westminster, where they will um, vote on bills and provide consent for um, the policies of the king. And Henry VIII really increases the role of Parliament by making it clear that Parliament should be involved in the big decisions of the day, such as the Reformation, changing the church. And this continues. And of course, it gives Parliament a sense of their growing importance and their role in governance. But Charles very much sees himself as an absolute monarch. And to a large extent, he is, of course, because the king can dissolve Parliament and the king can call Parliament. But it is a king's decision whether or not there is a Parliament at all. However, Charles is very much on a collision course with his parliament. They are divided in religion. The vast majority of the English parliament are Puritan by inclination. And they also have a growing sense of indignation about the way they perceive the king as governing. So he's on a collision course. The parliament is divided into two houses, the House of Lords and the House of Commons. And for Charles to enter the House of Commons, is seen as an affront to the powers of Parliament because, of course, he is not a commoner. His place is in the House of Lords. Charles entering the House of Commons has often been seen as the symbolic beginning of a civil war because what it was was that there were various elements within the Commons, including Oliver Cromwell and Francis Pym, who were hostile to the King and would not vote him the money that he was asking for. So he, going against precedent that had existed since the foundation of Parliament, went in to arrest these people himself. And of course, they'd been tipped off by various conspirators who were sympathetic to their aims. And Charles famously said, as he walked in to find these people gone, ah, the birds have flown. But the problem with that was it was very much the sense that it showed Charles' impotence, it showed the way in which Parliament, even as he did something which was catastrophically against any kind of precedent, he didn't even achieve what he wanted to. I mean, if he'd come and executed them on the spot, it would have been a brutal and dreadful thing to have done, but at least it would have shown that he was capable of doing it, but as it was, it just made him look even more pathetic than he already was. So trouble has been brewing in Scotland, England and Ireland um, throughout Charles's reign, and it really erupts into civil war. Um, it's sometimes known as the War of the Three Kingdoms because actually there are separate conflicts in each of Charles's kingdoms. In England, he is in opposition to Parliament. Um, he is forced to recall Parliament to raise funds for his bishop's war in Scotland. Charles has never had a happy relationship with Parliament. He rules alone for 11 years with no Parliaments, but in 1640 he is embroiled in war in Scotland and he needs money to pay his troops. And the only way that the king can raise taxation, a subsidy in England, is to have a subsidy voted for in Parliament. So he is forced to recall Parliament. And this is the short Parliament. And it's a short Parliament because it lasts just for three weeks, um, becoming very, very critical of Charles before he dissolves Parliament again. He hasn't got his subsidy, so he hasn't got any extra money to pay for his troops. And so he is forced very quickly to recall Parliament once again. And this is the long Parliament, and this is the Parliament that sits throughout the Civil War period. Once again, Charles is subject to considerable criticism by Parliament. They are very much trying to force him to take action, to change what they see as his abuses, um, and in exchange they then may grant him his subsidy. But it continues to spiral out of control, and eventually both sides begin raising troops. The First Civil War was a war essentially waged between the Royalist side and the Parliamentarian side over the sovereignty of Parliament and the sovereignty of the King. Had the King and the Royalist side won, but it would have reduced Parliament to nothing more than the most basic rump. And it would have made them nothing less than the servile, ob the servile object of the King. It was therefore absolutely crucial to both sides from an existential level that they won. So you can see that the first English Civil War, and indeed 
the major civil war that had been fought in the country up to that point, I mean, even if things like War of the Roses, in terms of brutality and in terms of families being pitted against each other, because everybody had to take a perspective on it. You were a, you were a royalist or you were a parliamentarian, or you were a roundhead and you were a cavalier. But the interesting thing was, was, for the first part of the war, it very much looked as if Charles was going to win. There wasn't going to be an awful lot of difficulty in the royalist forces winning, because obviously they had a, they had the army, they had the, they had the training, they were the people who were operating from a perspective of it being far easier for them. The parliamentarians, until about 1645, were not in a position to be waging war on this kind of scale. Then the rise of Oliver Cromwell, who completely changed the army and turned it into the new model army, was vital, that changed it. And then after that, the first civil war was resulted in a parliamentarian victory. Oliver Cromwell is to some people in England one of the great heroes of our time. He's the only man who brought about an English Republic, albeit for a mere 11 years. He's a man of principle, a man of upstanding moral values, and the sort of person that we should have had more of in our history. To some people, Cromwell is a traitor, perhaps the most evil man that's ever been in English history, a man dictated by religious extremism that makes him look like a precursor to the Taliban, somebody of absolutely uncompromising immoral views which were covered by a thin veneer of hypocrisy. Cromwell is not somebody who you can have no, no opinion about. He was a vital figure to English history. He's somebody whose people will always celebrate or condemn depending on inclination. In Ireland he is a folk villain, to some people he is a hero. But who was Oliver Cromwell? That's always going to be a difficult question to answer. He's also an incredibly good general. And this, of course, becomes apparent in the Civil War. As soon as war breaks out, he heads to East Anglia, where he starts to raise troops. And he is personally responsible for stopping um, the plates and the treasures of Cambridge University being passed to the king to shore up the king's war effort. He quickly becomes a commander and then a general in the parliamentarian army. And he's very, very good at it. Again, with no military background and no training. He leads cavalry charges in the battles at Marsden Moor, for example. And it's usual with cavalry in, in war in the period where the cavalry will make a charge and then they disperse. But with Oliver Cromwell, he has arranged with his cavalry that they will charge and then they will turn around and they will charge again. And this is quite revolutionary. He is very revolutionary in the way he views the military. England at this point doesn't have a standing army. So if the king, or in this case parliament, want to raise troops, they have to go out for every conflict and go and raise troops. This is often through the militia, but the militia are only required to serve in their own counties usually, which obviously causes problems. So Oliver Cromwell creates his new model army. So this is really the first large standing army in England. These are professional soldiers who are recruited and then trained to serve in Parliament's army. And the new model army, under the command of Sir Thomas Fairfax, is an absolute game changer in the Civil War. There is nothing that Charles I has that can counter this army. And really, it is what leads Parliament to victory. After Charles was captured and the first of the war ended, what he tried to do was essentially to enter an alliance with the Scots, which would then put him back on the throne by force. And at this stage, you can see that Charles is acting out of a mixture of desperation and cunning. He's desperate because he wants to be king still. He's desperate because he doesn't... Un what he feared was that he was going to be allowed to remain king, but the most puppet ruler imaginable. He would have no influence of his own. Every single decision would be made for him by parliament. And all he'd be doing would be rubber stamping documents. He would have no opportunity to, to reign in any kind of independent way. But on the other hand, at least he'd still be alive. The only thing is that he, he believed was that there was no question he could be executed because you can't kill a king. I mean, such a thing was impossible. So he was behaving in this fairly outrageous way. But there was also this existential divide between Thomas Fairfax, who was a moderate, who believed that Charles was king and that was the end of it, whatever happened, or Oliver Cromwell, who had rather different opinions about this. The Second Civil War was a shorter and less celebrated affair, but it was still just as consequential because it essentially involved Charles allying with the Scots and trying to bring about 
the, the rump of, of the Royalist army and essentially trying to take on the parliamentarian forces. And he failed entirely. And in fact, the Second Civil War is one of the most pointless wars that's ever, ever been fought in England because Charles's ideas were not necessarily bad ones, but there was not the appetite on any side for any sort of battle of that kind. And so by its resolution, the fact that the people who'd been murmuring beforehand that Charles could not be allowed to live were now shouting it. So from his perspective, it was a pointless war that signed his death warrant. When the Civil War begins, um, nobody has it in mind that they want to remove the king or even execute him. That's simply not in anybody's minds. And it's really something that develops over time. For a long time, after Charles has surrendered to the Scots and been placed in the hands of the English Parliament, he is negotiating with the English Parliament, but they find him a very, very difficult person to negotiate with. He doesn't really want to give anything away. Finally, Charles escapes from Hampton Court and flees the Isle of Wight, and he's quickly recaptured, but it's really at this point that the parliamentarians, led at this stage by Oliver Cromwell, start to envisage a future without the king as um, head. It starts to envisage a future without the king as head of state. And so finally, in January 1649, they resolve to try Charles for treason. And this is hugely controversial and absolutely revolutionary, because, of course, treason is a crime of conspiring against the king. So how can the king be guilty of treason? You have to really sort of, you have to change the definition of the crime itself to see treason as being guilty of a crime against the state. So it's very, very revolutionary, very unusual, and it makes a lot of people in Parliament quite uneasy. The trial of Charles I is one of the most bizarre and yet extraordinary things that ever took place in English history. I mean, a king being put on trial for high treason. And Charles's attitude towards the trial showed him at his best, because he said, I cannot be tried by you, I am not answerable to an earthly court, you do not have any right or justification to try me for treason, because there is no possibility that I could be traitorous to anyone. The argument that he was on trial for treason, treason to Parliament, I mean, people have debated this for centuries. Was Charles right? Could he have committed treason? And I think the answer is technically no. You can't be a traitor if you have a king. And so that's why the problem came about that there was a lot of ill feeling amongst many of the people who wanted to try Charles. And in fact, there had to be this majority of people who would eventually sign his death warrant, and they were known as the regicides, because many others, including you know, people who'd been leading figures in the parla parliamentarian forces, such as Fairfax, simply refused to do it, because they said, if you do this, you're not only killing the king, but you're opening up a precedent for decades and decades of further strife, decades of bloodshed. If you do this, you are basically condemning England to becoming the most blood-soaked republic of the world. Charles, of course, doesn't recognise the authority of the court. Um, and a lot of other people in the country also don't recognise its authority. But nonetheless, he is unsurprisingly convicted and he's sentenced to be executed. At the end of January, he is led out onto a scaffold that's been erected outside the banqueting house at Whitehall and he is then beheaded. When Oliver Cromwell actually later views the body, he actually says it was cruel necessity. Um, and really, that is the sense that you get with Charles's execution. It wasn't something that was actually looked for, but it, become, it becomes a point where Parliament consider that they can't, they can't do a deal with Charles. And there's a danger, of course, that if you keep the king in place, he will at some point come back and take revenge on you. And again, it was said in Parliament, you know, that if you, if you fight the king 100 times and he loses 99 times, he will still be the king. But if Parliament loses just once, they can face disaster. And so really, Charles's execution is, it's a failure in Charles to understand the severity of the situation and to negotiate. And it's a failure of the ability to make the new future that's envisaged by Parliament work with the king. Well, Charles I was executed outside Banqueting House in Whitehall, and it was a very chilly day, and he had to wear an extra shirt under the shirt that he was wearing because he didn't want to shiver, because he felt that if he was seen shaky, people would assume he was frightened. And he went to his death with remarkable equanimity, actually. He made a short speech in which he talks about going from a corruptible world into an incorruptible one, but he knelt down on the scaffold and was beheaded. And what happened is that his head was held up and the executioner said, behold the head of a traitor. 
And Samuel Pepys, who was present that day, said, I'd never heard such a great groan amongst, amongst my fellow man as I ever heard that day. Because there was a real sense, not of celebration or of jubilation that he'd been executed, but of fear. What comes now? What's going to happen? What have we done? He very much portrayed himself as a martyr, and this is how he wanted people to remember him. He had a final meeting with some of his children, for example, before his execution, where you know he really set out his advice for the future, um, told them how to behave. He was a very dignified figure, but also one who was absolutely convinced of his own righteousness. You know, there is no, there are no doubts in Charles. Throughout the period, he was absolutely convinced that he was right. So I think it's unlikely that he did have a moment of regret. I imagine he was upset, um, probably fearful. I mean, I think most people would be, but I don't think even at this stage, Charles doubted his conduct. Obviously regretful that he has lost the Civil War, but I think were he to live his life again, he would probably pretty much do the same things again. And that really is, Charles's character.